Welcome to the Film Gamer Podcast. This is going to be a first-of-its-kind episode because I've been following box office for 18 years, ever since my dad took me to see Ice Age 2, the meltdown in theaters, and it was bad, but it did so good at the box office, and ever since then I've been obsessed with the movie's performance at the box office, so I'm going to share that obsession with you. I'm going to give context to the grosses that movies make in the theater that's at the box office where you buy your ticket even if it's online now it's still the same thing and where that money goes what it means and uh, hopefully clear some up and give you some decent analysis that's slightly different from what you may read or if you've never read or understood clear things up for you so this is the weekend this past weekend of february 23rd to 25th 2024 these are estimates actuals will come in usually they come in on monday and they're a bit more specific but they're only a difference of a million or two unless a movie makes a giant amount of money which of course no movie did this weekend uh so starting we have a holdover in the number one spot bob marley one love my sister saw this in theaters and liked it it made 13 and a half million um, dropping about 52%. That's to be expected uh, for most movies. The rule of thumb is that they usually drop 50%. If they're good, they drop less than that. If they're bad, they drop more than that. That's just generally the rule. Um, it opened in about 3,500 theaters. 3,000 is like for a regular amount of theaters. This is in North America, so the United States and Canada. And anything over 3,000 is a big release or ultra-wide. Uh, and anything over 4,000 is like a blockbuster, so it's super ultra-wide. Um, anyways, this movie made about $71 million. 50 of that was made just in Valentine's Day weekend uh, last week. And um, it was so big that it actually had people running to Hollywood saying, oh, biopics are the next superhero movies. Biopics are the next superhero movies. So they hired Rid Ridley Scott to do a Bee Gees movie for Paramount Pictures and a bunch of other people are trying to get biopics made about, you know, anything, you know, particularly musical biopics. So this was a nice hit for Paramount, whose film division has flagged behind the others, um, They've struggled a lot compared to the other um, four movie studios, which, if you don't know, are Walt Disney Pictures, who owns Fox. They have Warner Brothers. There's Universal Pictures. There's Sony, who has Columbia Pictures. Um, and then, if you want to get into the mini majors, um, aside from Paramount, who's the fifth of the main five, there's um, also M uh, MGM. Uh, which is owned by Amazon now, and Lionsgate, which is, you know, where the Hunger Games and J the John Wick and Twilight series come from. And they're Canadian based and have wanted to make big for a, a while. And they just kind of can't get there because the big companies are so big. It's so big that, you know, in April it's discussed that maybe Warner Brothers might be sold to Universal, which would be horrible because it would mean less movies, but I'm not going to get into the weeds on that now. I'll just continue down the list. So Bob Marley, big hit for Paramount. Mean Girls uh, last month was another good hit for them, so they're on a roll. They're doing the best this year. Um, second spot is Demon Sawyer Kimitsu no Yeba uh, to the Hashira Training. Uh, this is by Sony Pictures releasing under you know their Funimation anime uh, division. Um, they bought Crunchyroll, um, the streaming service, uh, and it's all rolled into one. Of course, uh, apparently they ripped off their, um, there were two competing anime services, basically, and Sony, um, bought them both, or bought one that inherited the other, and didn't roll over your account. So if you bought the losing streaming service, and you're was merged into Funimation or Crunchyroll or whatever it was, um, your um, uh, Funimation account will not be honored. Why? Because, you know, corporations are greedy. That's big. Or it could be some incompatibility. I don't know, but maybe that's why people are going out to see Demon Slayer, which has had what I would call kind of surprising success at the box office. These are movies that are not marketed to me. They're not marketed to regular people. But they came up particularly during the pandemic. Uh, I remember one of these 
anime is opened against Mortal Kombat to over 20 million, um, as well as the Dragon Ball movies as well. So these are straight to the core marketed fan base movies. Um, this one appears to be like a TV episode or a TV adaptation. Um, I don't know too much about it. If you're listening, you can tell me more about it. But anyways, 11 and a half million for something that definitely cost uh, less than that. That's good money for Sony Pictures. Um, number three is Ordinary Angels, which I believe is a Lionsgate release. Um, stars Hilary Swank and uh, Jack Reacher himself, Alan Richson. Um, it's a religious movie about um, a guy who's saddled with medical debt. Um, and because, you know, he's in America, he can't afford it. So he needs to rely on Hilary Swank to do it. And, you know, it got an A plus cinema score. For those of you who don't know, cinema score is when they pull people in America as they walk out of the movie, asking them what grade they would give it. And it got an A plus. So, you know, people are easy to please. They like stuff that they like. And, you know, uh, the movie's hitting, I guess. So if the movie has a high cinema score, you can sometimes expect them to you know, carry on through word of mouth and the movies become hits. But uh, 6.5 million, you know, it's hard to climb up from that. But if anyone can do it, it was anyone but you, which I'll get to further on down the list. Um, Madam Web, 6 million, dropped 60%. This movie got trashed by the critics. Um, it actually came in to about the proper expectations. The movie apparently cost 80 to 100 million, uh, which I'm sure they'll make back because if there's one good thing that Sony who distributed it did um, aside from all the terrible creative decisions that they did it is that this movie has a good pipeline of being in theaters, staying in theaters which a lot of even the big companies don't do now because they want to double dip in all the marketing money they spent to promote their movie in theaters they want to cash in on that by going straight to premium video on demand and that's where it can get like ripped and downloaded and pirated and kind of cheapens the movie a bit um you know so there aren't really a lot of theater experiences um so anyway this movie dropped 60 percent uh so it's six million and do a 35 million total what i like to do when just guessing again the rule of thumb like i said earlier when movies drop 50 percent what i like to do is i take the total gross that it has in total including the weekend which in this case is $35 million, and then add the amount of money they grossed this weekend alone, $6 million to it. So uh, that would be about $41 million. That is maybe on the low end that you can expect for a total because, you know, it completely discounts weekdays, assuming it makes no money. Um, but I just simply consider that for a rule of thumb because sometimes movies do much worse uh, sometimes they do much better during the day. We don't know there are ups and downs, and particularly during holidays. But <clears throat> nonetheless, this is obviously less than Sony was hoping for this movie. Um, but, you know, um, according to everybody who saw the movie, it's universally terrible. So, you know, they should be happy with what they get. So uh, we're going to move on to Migration. Migration was made by the people who made Despicable Me and released by Universal Pictures, who does all the Despicable Me releases, and because uh, they own that company now. And it's made about $120 million, uh, which is very good. The movie didn't cost that much. I think it cost around $50 million. Uh, if you're listening, you can correct me. But nonetheless, it's a hit. Uh, worldwide, it's made about $250 million. This was the last movie of the year to cross $100 million, unless anybody but you, um, anyone but you, sorry, has like a miracle run and uh, crosses $100 million, which is still a few ways off. This is the last movie to gross $100 million in 2023 out of all those releases, so, you know, good for them. It is the only kids movie weirdly playing in theaters um and it will be until kung fu panda which i just find so weird because that's like a three month gap between kids releases and i'm just wondering where are all the middle tier kids movies you know like last year uh, ruby gilman teenage kraken or um you have something like mummies or something those can come out and do really good business but we have these really dry spouts of like have a five-year-old nephew where are you going to take him to well i guess you're going to wait for kung fu panda you know um and what if you don't like migration well you know 
parents are desperate and sometimes they take their kids to movies which aren't that good which um you know i become more aware of as i get older but <clears throat> and particularly as i mentioned i saw ice age 2 um you know and uh i was a bit old for that at the time i'm trying to think if it was 2006 march i would have been around 12 years old for that movie but you know i wanted to see it because the first one was so good and you see these kids' movies, and a lot of resources go into them. Like, you know, $50 million is not nothing. And it's hopefully good, uh, but, you know, um, the things adults do to entertain their kids. Anyway, it's a big hit. Uh, moving on, another Universal distributed picture. Um, they distributed Argyle. It's an Apple Films release. Uh, so Apple basically made the movie... Um, paid for it, and then they gave it to Universal Pictures to release in theaters because they're not interested in making that money themselves. And my understanding of the arrangement, because they've had similar arrangements uh, with Killers of the Flower Moon, with um, Paramount Pictures, and Napoleon with Sony, where basically they fund Sony's marketing. If they make the amount of money back on marketing, they get paid um, by the gross. So if the movie makes money, they get their money back. If uh, the movie doesn't, then they don't, so it's kind of like a risk-reward thing. Apple is, I believe, one of the most valued companies of all time. It's a trillion-dollar company, so even if they lose money on a movie like Argyle, which lost $200 million, uh, an insane amount of that movie to cost, and it doesn't look it, it looks very cheap, um, but a lot of people famous are in it. And it was number one for two weeks, so... My guess is Apple's strategy is to, A, make stuff that people want to see, uh, even if it's straight-to-video Netflix quality. Um, and the other thing that they want to do is is basically experiment and find out how they can fit into this entertainment service, because entertainment is kind of the future here. So Argyle cost $200 million, but it was number one for two weeks. It's down, you know, about 42%, so it's somewhat stable made about 41 million um and worldwide it's made 86 million so not a lot this is a huge bomb for any company that would close any business that wasn't um you know apple but you know we'll see where they go with their next movies coming out down the line uh the next one number seven is wonka two and a half million this was kind of the big Christmas movie of the season that a lot of people went to see. It's made now over $600 million worldwide. It has eclipsed Charlie and the Chocolate Factory to be the highest grossing, like, Willy Wonka title, not adjusted for inflation, of course, because, you know, 2005 money now is worth more than that, but I genuinely don't like to uh, adjust for inflation because different markets, different competition, different times, you know, um... And tickets are more expensive, so less people just go to the movies, and they're often come to video sooner. Um, the standard, uh, it's almost like 45 days now. It used to be 90. Before that, it was like six months. But now you can, you know, two weeks, especially if a movie underperforms, it goes straight to premium video on demand. And it's like, yeah, 20 bucks, but, you know, people will pay that. Um, I still like to wait when it's six ninety five. But moving on, Drive Away Dolls, another Universal release. This is from their specialty division uh, by Focus Features, and um, this is another bomb for them in a row. They a few weeks ago made Lisa Frankenstein, and um, that had a Sprouse brother in it. So obviously, it wasn't good. I cannot recall, uh, aside from Big Daddy, those actors ever being in a movie that was good um and riverdale was okay maybe for a season and then it dropped off for me and it took everyone else a, a few seasons to catch up but yeah it's just anytime a sprouse is involved uh no offense to them i'm sure they're nice enough guys but they don't pick quality projects and that's the thing is that there are a lot of famous actors today that just pick crappy projects and um yeah um, that's one of them. Now, Drive Away Dolls is from Ethan Cohen, um, who is one half of the Cohen brothers who won Best Picture uh, for No Country for Old Men, and I believe they won some Oscars earlier in their career for Fargo. Um, so, you know, they're good. 
one they broke up one made tragedy of macbeth which was an apple film made by a24 and the other one uh, made this driveway dolls so if you notice they made you know fargo and then big lebowski um you know uh, ethan is appearing to be kind of the funnier goofier one of them you know after they made no country for old men they made burn after reading so the burn after reading you know big lebowski guy this is kind of more his thing um he co-wrote it with his wife um the critics liked it enough um saying hey it was okay for its time but audiences gave it like a c minus and then according to cinema scores that i mentioned earlier it's the worst that they've made um of that time so uh just finishing up here we have the beekeeper um which made 1.9 million this weekend this is its seventh weekend and it's distributed by mgm and it's a big hit it's about 150 million worldwide 63 million and this was just right place right time it's just a simple jason statham beat him up but um according to its plot about halfway through the stakes get raised ridiculously as if it's an you know 80s 70s exploitation film and uh, it's like this goes straight to the top and the government gets involved the u.s government which is hilarious because it's just simply um a matter especially in this time where there are billionaires running around and government going unchecked and you know this is a movie that basically puts accountability in the hands of jason statham and he beats them up which you'll never see in real life and uh they suffer uh which they never do in real life as well uh, so people really want to see that on screen and they're ritually rewarded with it and the film was ritually rewarded it's a big hit so Moving on, you have The Chosen, a uh, religious series. Very fascinating. This is by Fathom Events, who are very good at doing these one, two-week event type things. And uh, they're releasing this religious uh, series in theaters. People are going to watch. And I believe they'll be doing this all throughout, you know, Lent uh, in Easter season. So uh, very good if you're... A, looking for a distributor and you know all the majors said no uh, fathom is really good at maximizing their uh, money and profits and getting people excited about you know small things but making an event out of them uh, i noticed that with the terrifier movie uh, terrifier 2 doing really well it made about 10 million and it costs like nothing comparatively so yeah that's the top 10 and um just finishing up going through anyone but you still making a million 1.2 million this weekend, 87 million total, made 200 million total. This is a movie that costs 25 million and is probably the highest grossing romantic comedy since Crazy Rich Asians back in 2018. I can't even name another romantic comedy that was really a romantic comedy and wasn't like an action movie or a superhero movie or something that did well. Um, so props to this movie. I hear it's okay um so we'll see i like will gluck's previous movies he did easy a and friends with benefits um in the peter rabbit movies which were surprisingly funny as well as annie um so you know he's a funny guy and people are just looking for laughs and want to see hot people fall in love so that's what it is and then uh have a movie land a bad action movie with two hemsworth brothers that are not chris and russell crowe Apparently it's all right, um, did all right, three and a half million. That play is on straight to video, so we'll see how that does. And then you have the Oscar movies, Poor Things, 32 million. A decent amount of money for the Searchlight Pictures, their division of Fox, which is a division of Disney. So, you know, good for them. Uh, it's made uh, about 100 million worldwide, personally, I think with most independent art house films if they just released them wide nine times out of ten they would do better um but the idea is that they can't compete with major films but you know they're owned by the majors so what's what's the deal there i don't know nonetheless it's played the track it opened well in like two or three theaters which these art house movies do and slowly expanded starting in um december and now you know post oscar season it's gotten like 11 oscar nominations and is doing well so you know it's the one time out of 10 that it's worked really well and um yeah 
Uh, I watched it. If you want to read the review, you can go and listen to the previous podcast episode of that, or you can um, simply read my review on filmgamer.com. So moving down the list, you have Mean Girls, which just crossed 100 million globally, uh, made 72 million. This is the musical remake of it that's based on the play that was based on the 2004 film. So, you know, uh, people like that movie enough. Uh, I saw a clip of it circulating that people were making fun of its blocking, but um, I saw the appeal in it, so I'll watch it when it falls on Paramount+. Plus. That's Paramount's first hit of the year. And then just cleaning up, because I haven't mentioned any of these films before, Night Swim, which is, you know, uh, of course, Universal, who I've mentioned several times on this. They um, are the second biggest or third biggest, like, they're basically major top of the heap they make a lot of movies and this is in their indie horror film division uh blumhouse or at least sorry blumhouse which joined with atomic monster which is the saw guys james wan they merged and they have a first look deal with universal pictures so universal doesn't make all of their movies but they will take a first look and distribute some of them so you know they had a big hit with them get out uh, they had a big hit with the Purge movies, so they continue to do business together. So, um, you know, this movie cost maybe $15 million. It's made $30, $40 million worldwide. Um, if I check, no, $50 million worldwide. So it's done well, but uh, by all accounts, it's a bad movie. So the next Blumhouse movie will really have to be different because this is potentially a brand-damaging movie. Uh, it's the first horror movie uh, of the year that came out first weekend, and it's still playing. Finishing off the list, we have The Taste of Things, which is still making, you know, $300,000, uh, $1.8 million total. This is an independent film channel, IFC film, and uh, famously, this was the movie that France chose instead of Anatomy of a Fall to represent it at the Academy Awards. It in my opinion, was the right decision because it made more people interested in this movie, uh, starring Juliette Binoche, and it's well-reviewed in a uh, positive film. I'm sure many people will uh, like it. Um, and then we have The Zone of Interest, which I've reviewed on this podcast, and uh, you can see it's making about $296 million, $7 million total. This is not the kind of film that really does well in theaters at all. It's at 16 million worldwide. I would not be surprised if it ends up winning Best Picture. I'll say that now. Because it's very good. It's in my top three, I go Holdovers, Anatomy of a Fall, and this. But it's a sublime picture. You can't really fault it. Um, it's practically a 9.5 out of 10 for me. Uh, you can follow me on Letterboxd about it. But yeah, great movie. It's the kind of film that does well because of its Oscar attention. It has five Academy Award nominations, including Best Picture, Best Director, Best Adapted Screenplay, Best Sound, which I honestly think it will steal from Oppenheimer because it is a better choice, in my opinion, um, and Best International Film, of course, which it will undoubtedly win. Um, the Taste of Things wasn't nominated. Anatomy of a Fall wasn't nominated. There are a couple other movies in there, like uh, The Teacher's Lounge, which is nominated again. That's by Sony Pictures releasing. Um, and, um, you know, uh, Sony Pictures Classics. Um, they have the most low-key um, movies that they make for Sony Pictures Classics. A uh, big hit for them was the remake of Ikaru that they had, uh, starring Bill Nye. Um, and, uh, the funny thing about that is that that got two Academy Award nominations, um, Living, it was called, and, uh, I started to watch it, but the time sync was off on, uh, the app that I was watching it on, on Crave. Anyway, it made 12 million, 12 million dollars, and that's a big hit for Sony Pictures Classics, so that's just kind of the numbers that they're dealing with. When we get this far down into the list, you have to understand that, my rule of thumb is usually if a movie opens to over $20 million, it's a hit. If it makes over $100 million, it's a blockbuster. But now movies cost so much more. There are a lot of films which will open and just kind of 
be released in theaters and then they'll go through video on demand they'll go through their dvd release they'll go through streaming and they'll sell off territorial rights and once they do all of that it's basically paid for uh which is how a lot of these indie film studios thrive and um yeah so just going through we have an oscar hopeful uh origin Origin by Ava DuVernay, which I honestly think did not get nominated because it wasn't available to enough people. Um, it played at the Toronto Film Festival. I saw the director there, but I didn't end up seeing it. It seemed intriguing to me. I've heard good things, and I've heard people disagree with it, um, that it doesn't work. Uh, I'm interested in seeing it nonetheless when it arrives on streaming. If it does, um, I'll totally watch it. And then you got, you know, Trolls Band Together, which did well again, didn't have any competition really until Migration showed up, which is cleaning up. I saw The Iron Claw on Christmas Day with my family. That just passed 35 million, 40 million worldwide total. You have Wish, which, after all, ancillaries, you know, this is a movie that cost essentially like something like $250 million, or maybe it was 150. I'll have to look it up, but, uh, the way that Disney does it is they include all their production and their marketing all in one. So they break even uh, a lot more, as we saw with Elemental earlier this year, which made almost $500 million after a quiet opening. Um, but Wish, after it releases on Blu-ray in March and stuff and does well on streaming, I'm sure it'll make some money. Apparently it's a mediocre movie, but I like the uh, title single. Um, this wish that Ariana DeBose sings in the movie. So that's that. And then you have the holdovers just crossed 20 million. So frustrating to me how this movie did. This is a Christmas movie that they released in a limited release at Halloween. Again, a third bomb for focus features. Like, yeah, it made 42 million worldwide. It could have made a lot more, but they just didn't understand that a Christmas movie should be released at Christmas. And they thought that this was the way to do it. And yeah, you know, it got five Academy Award nominations. So what? What's frustrating to me is this is a movie that was way more accessible and could have made more. But, you know, the stubborn whatever is going on out there is a questionable release strategy. Similar to All of Us Strangers, another hugely acclaimed film of the year, was not even available at Toronto Film Festival, the one film festival that I go to. Um... Searchlight Pictures, as you know, Division of Fox, they had poor things going, so they're not, you know, disappointed really. But, like, what is it with these films that seem so elitist that they're never available to see in theaters? You don't see them until way later in the year, and then they come out and they make no money, and people are surprised. I've seen people crying on Twitter that All the Strangers is not available. And you know what? When a movie is not available, you can't be disappointed that it doesn't get nominated for Academy Awards because people have to see a movie in order to like it. And it's just kind of a different world we live in now. But anyway, that concludes my box office report. Um, next week's will be a lot more straightforward. It'll basically have Dune in it, and I'll have gone through most of the movies, so it won't be as long. And uh, if you like this, let me know. Give me a follow. Give me a like. Um, and um, I'll see you, or you'll hear me, next week on the FilmGamer.com podcast.